Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Pitching It with Ben. In this episode, I am joined by LPGA Tour member Lilia Vu. So one of the things that really stood out to me in this conversation with Lilia, and something that I think will definitely stand out as you listen, is her incredible ability to recall rounds and shots. So not just her round last week, but her round last summer and her round from three years ago. Like she can recall those things with so much detail. It's amazing. And this makes her such a wonderful storyteller. And we go into a lot of details of things. We talk about her rookie year on the LPJ tour in 2019 and some of the struggles that came with that and what kind of happened in the two years after that. It was, it was quite the journey, not the easiest, easiest time in her life. But she talks about how she battled back and how she gets back to where she is now, a member of the LPGA Tour in 2022. Thanks in large part to three wins, three wins on the Epson Tour in 2021, formerly known as the Symmetra Tour. And yeah, we talk about so many incredible things and fun things. And Lilia also, she has a lot of amazing advice. She, it's, it's advice that can be applied to your golf game, but it's also advice that can, can be applied to everyday life. So without taking any more time, thank you all for listening and enjoy this episode with Lilia. I am back with another episode of Pitching It With Ben, and I am incredibly excited to be joined by LPGA Tour member, former All-American at UCLA, and three-time winner on the Symmetra Tour last year in 2021, Lilia Vu. Yeah, thank you for having me, Ben. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for joining me. You know, we've had a couple of, uh, this is actually like the third on-camera interview that we've had. But, I think so, yeah. But maybe, like, I'm actually excited to get a little more in-depth. So I appreciate you taking some time. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, what have you been up to? So like this off-season, which for you is very unique, and you may not ever have the situation again, but your last official like Symmetra Tour event was on October 7th I think and you had things kind of locked up and did you play any events after the the Symmetra Tour championship? No I didn't I just kind of I mean I took a week off after that from golf and then I got really excited to practice again so I've just been playing and practicing a lot and just uh working out a lot trying to get uh my injuries in you know worked out injuries injuries wait did you okay can you touch on that a little bit if you feel comfortable like what what kind of injuries you were you dealing with working on getting better so my lower back has always hurt since college so we've been working on that I've been doing physical therapy and acupuncture is something that I started this off season and it's really helped me I don't know why my body responds so well to needles but it's (laughs) <laughs> that sounded weird no 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 it just like responds really weird well to acupuncture that's what I meant and then yeah so I've been experimenting with that and then just playing a lot I mean it's actually rained a lot more than it usually does in California so it was like five days of rain it was like during Christmas but I felt like it was the end of the world <laughs> yes you especially you southern California people are like oh no, it's rain, which yeah, I get it. But living in the Midwest where we get rain, like, especially during spring and summer, if we go more than a week, it's like without mm-hmm. at least one day of rain, it's like, yeah, it's a little strange. So yeah, too bad for you. And that we can <laughs> rain. <laughs> I mean, I like rain, don't get me wrong, but it's good if it's about one day, like after two days of rain, you're just kind of sitting there like, when is this going to stop? I'm ready for a uh, sunny California per usual. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. So during this off season, you did, okay, some acupuncture, working on these injuries, your lower back, getting that feeling better. Is there anything you've been working on with your golf game? Mm, yeah. I'm still doing my little drills that I usually do to keep my game in check. Um, yeah. And I've been working on some combine gains on my track man so I've been doing that stuff and just playing a lot I love playing so just as on the co- course as much as I can yeah so you much more of a course player than a range grinder yeah I feel like unless I have 
certain drills that I'm doing on the range or when I'm practicing or games that I do by myself, then it's really productive. But I just can't be on the range just pounding golf balls. I'd rather just go on the course and between me and someone else. Yeah. So yeah. can you, and you, it's interesting to hear like playing games. And I think that this is something that a learning moment for amateurs that are listening to this. It's tough to play. Like most amateurs, we don't have a lot of time to practice, but it would be very beneficial if you did, but it can get monotonous, like low key kind of boring. If you're just hitting balls, what, what is an example of a game that you play? Well, I mostly do my combine game. So I created my own tests. I know the regular amateur probably doesn't have, doesn't need a track man, but one thing I do that doesn't involve that is um, I hit a different club every shot. So say there's different flags on the range. So I'll just, first you hit a driver because usually that's what you start off on a par four or par five. So I'll pick two pins and that's my fairway. And then I'll hit and then I'll go to say a 155 shot and then I'll hit to that pin with a seven iron. The next one, if I don't um, hit it on the green, then I'll hit a chip shot. And then I'll do that and basically emulate par fours or par fives and then par threes too. So just a different shot every single time because I like the spontaneous practice, a different club every time. Because when you're on the course, you're not hitting 30 drivers in a row or or 26 irons in a row so you have to switch it up so that's something that really helps me and I'm really focused because now I have different targets to aim at and I'm not just hitting golf balls right and that's mm-hmm. like and it's slightly different uh, slightly different swings too like your driver is a different swing than hey like hitting your wedge like it's it's yeah. not it's not all the same whenever you get into the pattern of like hitting 20 with one club whatever it is like it seems like that would not be necessarily the most beneficial. I guess it probably works for somebody, but I yeah. like I like it, your approach. It it doesn't work for me. I think <laughs> honestly, so I get better when I'm playing on the golf course than I do just five hours on the range. I usually, if I am on the range, I usually find somebody that's willing to do an approach shot contest with me, and then we'll just go <laughs> to like ten different flags, and that's super fun for me. As long as there's like a game so yeah yeah (laughs) I like it (laughs) so I want to go back a little bit back in time where it all began when is the first time that you picked up a golf club I went to the range with my older brother and my dad and they had started golf first and I would just watch them I think I was six or seven at this point and I think I was trying to be funny and imitate my brother my dad has this video of me just like air swinging and then they let me try it and I hit the ball pretty well. So just kept playing golf. And now I play golf and my brother does it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a natural from the get go. That's what you're saying. Kind, kind of, of, yeah. <laughs> kind of. As much as you can be with the golf. Yeah. What are your, some, some of your earliest memories of that time? Hmm. I remember there was a, a golf course in Santa Ana. I'm pretty sure it's still there. It's called Riverview. It was this small public course and they had 18 holes on that putting green. And I would do putting contests with my brother and my dad all the time. So I think that's where like the game thing mentality started, honestly, because I just, I'm just super competitive. Low key though, very Low quiet. Competitive. Yeah, I don't like being loud and like, oh, I'm gonna, like. I just don't like being in people's face about it. I'll just be like, okay, we'll play. Right. And, and yeah. not, not lots of fist pumps on the golf course. Okay. So in college, I never really fist pumped, but I think I started getting really into it at Curtis Cup because there's this, there's two videos that it was um, uh, in my match. I like did a huge fist pump. One was on the 18th hole on the final day in my singles match. And I was like, damn. I could transition myself to being a more fiery player. And then I think after that, it just felt more natural. I mean, even last year, I think I fist pumped maybe twice. I saw I two. Wanna... I saw two. Yeah, yeah, good. exactly. <laughs> I didn't want to like 
it almost feels wrong to be in people's face about it, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, Tiger Woods does it, so, I mean, <laughs> maybe I could start doing it more, but I don't want to do it every single putt because it means less, I guess. <laughs> right. What, like, yeah. you're, you said low-key competitor, low-key, like, the fist pumps to my memory were pretty low-key, though. They were, they were more like, like, not the <laughs> full, like, going across the green, like, that, when you think of Tiger, you know, like, it wasn't fist pumps yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You Those were definitely natural because they weren't planned. So <laughs> <laughs> I totally had. So uh, when I was playing in like the one tournament I play here, city golf tournament here, I was playing awful, but I was paired with my cousin and it was a par three. I hit the first tee shot in the hazard uh, or penalty area, whatever you want to call it now. And then I hit my, the third shot onto the green. He was like, and I had like, 35 feet left for bogey he's like if you make this you have to do a tiger fist pump <laughs> and i made it oh no way did you do it i did it but it okay. felt so awkward because i was so far over <laughs> par like it <laughs> like it, it was for That's bogey so but yeah. but nonetheless he, he but asked you still for remember it. it so i do still remember because i don't More memory fist, <laughs> i i don't i don't fist pump i don't have that many reasons to fist pump <laughs> well that but, was one that that was one um and it's interesting to me like I actually want to get to it in a little while when we get into your professional career but you talk about the putting contest you remember doing that and you're a really freaking good putter so it it does gives me shades of envy just hearing quotes from her over the years of like she that's something she practiced a lot like because yeah. those are to her i think i believe now that i can't completely quote her but essentially like that's the fun part like hearing the ball or seeing the ball go in like seeing it go in the hole and that's really cool that some of your earliest memories are having those putting contests it wasn't and that's something yeah. that you can do even as like a kid like of course it doesn't matter if your swings technically better than your dad or your older brother they're physically just going to hit it further than you at that time. Like there's stuff that you can't physically do, but in the putting green. Yeah. You can always, I mean, here. growing up, I feel like putting wasn't my, my strength until college. And I feel like that was, um, I think that was a change of putter. That was me learning from some of my teammates. That was me learning how to, how to read break. My coaches taught me aim point. Everything just kind of clicked at that point I mean I'm pretty sure in junior golf my putting was not good if it was <laughs> I would have definitely played better but I feel like that's something that came in college definitely college was where it changed for me and then also I think putting is so fun it's just the process of it just like reading the putt and seeing it and visualizing it and then setting up to the putt I always have this feeling where if I already know it's, if I feel like it's going to go in, it goes in. And it's so <laughs> satisfying, like knowing that you read the break, right? The speed's good and you hit on your line and it's just line after line. And that's honestly, I could putt for eight hours in a day and not get bored. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. I just love putting. <laughs> even, and even is black and pink so your putter is black and pink yeah so she's really cute <laughs> does she have a name too no it just says lils on the side but she's a okay. trooper for sure <laughs> so okay also when you were younger did you have any inspirations or role models that you were looking up to at that time definitely Annika Sorenstam I mean it was a great time too because there was the Annika Invitational that the AJGA had, and we were able to meet her every year and talk to her. So it was the craziest thing to me, but definitely Annika Sorensen and what she's done for junior golfers, the little girl, junior girls. Amazing. She's very involved. I think she's a great role model. Yeah. The, the term goat, meaning <laughs> greatest of all time. Because yeah. it was really funny. I saw like Meryl Streep. I don't know if you saw any of these interviews, but yeah. they were calling her. They were calling her. Goat. She literally thought she was being called. She was a goat. old. Yeah. 
That's oh, so funny. Go. I mean, the greatest of all time. It does get thrown around a lot. She's one of those like undisputed. Mm-hmm. It, there's not tons of undisputed, like greatest of all time, but it it does extend beyond her just playing career. Like what yeah. she has done is really cool. Yeah. And making appearances, like being there in person, not just putting your your name on a tournament, like yeah. or on an award. Like she gives she there's also opportunities to get to meet her and have you had any like interactions with her I think I did introduce myself when I was a junior golfer but I was so shy I probably just said like hi I'm Lilia nice to meet you and that's it <laughs> well you know she had last year she made her return to at least a couple of like competitive tournaments maybe you'll see her around this year who knows yeah. like I don't know what she's up to but yeah, and I really grew up, so I'm pretty sure if I did have the chance to talk to her again, I'll actually have some questions and not just be so shy. <laughs> not like the low-key starstruck, like, <gasps> Yeah, I do that all the time for anybody, like a PGA Tour golfer. I'm like, huh, I'm Lilia. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all good, though. Like, I mean, the thing is, I think hopefully you'll get to the point where you realize, like, hey, like, I'm important too. <laughs> I'm Lilia. I'm a, I'm a professional I, golfer. I'm go ahead. I feel like I'll probably not get to that point because I feel like the people around me will definitely keep me in check. Hmm. So they'll be like, Lilia, you're getting a little, and then I'd be like, okay, I promised myself I wouldn't be like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't have to like show it. It's like that, yeah. that, that fine line of like, that's internal self-belief mixed with yeah like, it's not about the it seems like you have that personality anyway you're not gonna go out and like yeah this is me <laughs> like <laughs> it just doesn't fit who I am I would be like oh this feels so unauthentic yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so after as you per, uh, progress through your junior golf career what when did you realize that you could and when did you want to play golf at the next level I feel like once everybody started looking at colleges to play for I think that's or like I saw the older girls going to UCLA or Stanford or USC and I was like okay that's what they're doing so I'll probably be in their footsteps and then once they got to college they started playing well started winning events and then they turned pro and I was like okay then I'll do that too and then I think probably going into college. I mean, I was probably about the shyest person ever. You can ask my old college teammates, my coaches, I could not even speak. I was just so (laughs) shy. And, and then I had um, one of my teammates take me under her wing and just help me and teach me like, okay, during a practice round, you got to take notes about everything. And she definitely paved the way because she was super successful, won a couple tournaments, and then she went on to turn pro. And then in my head, I was like, okay, let me just try to do everything that she's taught me because she honestly had no reason to help me. Like, it was just like, oh, I was like this little girl that's like deer in the headlights kind of thing. And then she was so nice to teach me all that stuff. And then I just tried to do what she did and have that fire in my own way. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. She, she's super cool and strong and fiery, but I did it in my own way. And then, yeah, it worked out pretty well. So it's interesting. I think you are being a little, it seems like to me, a little low-key humble right now because you did play at UCLA. So mm-hmm. it's it's not like you had to be playing pretty good to to get there. Well, like what was the recruiting process like for you? I know you live close to UCLA too, but what what was that recruiting process like for you? Um, I think I just well, I'm pretty sure I remember when I committed to UCLA. So I had gone to visit UCLA, oh my gosh. And we were sitting on the couch. I went with my parents and my older brother. And I remember coach sat down and we were all talking. My dad was asking the questions and my brother was also asking questions. And I just sat there in silence. And (laughs) my coach said, Lilia, do you have any questions for the girls or me? And I literally said, no, I don't have anything. And then my coach probably thought I didn't, wasn't interested in going but it was just a matter of how introverted I was and then um after going back and forth and then I think after ping invitational 
I don't remember what year, but coach had offered me scholarship. And then I said, yes, because UCL has always been my dream school. I know I didn't make it known that it was because I was so shy, but definitely that was my first choice. Right. Were there any other <laughs> visits or anybody else on your radar or were you on anybody else's no. radar? I think I visited UCLA and I was like, that's it. There's, there are two other schools on my radar, but I was like, UCLA is the one. <laughs> <laughs> so just like for context, how far is UCLA from like where you, you were living or home? 45 miles. 45 miles. Yeah. So pretty close. It was, it was perfect. It was perfect. The, if I'm homesick, I could just drive. I mean, there's traffic, but it's never too far. Yeah. Well, it is funny too. Like in LA, that's like, that's so far, like time wise. <laughs> that's like time wise. Yeah. yeah. Like where I'm at, 45 miles, I can get there in like 40 minutes. But, oh, wow. and <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> oh, wow. In LA, I've been in LA. It's like when I try to get to Wilshire from my, my aunt's house, oh. like 10 miles. It's not yeah. that far by miles, but then it's like, yeah, at least feels like at least an hour every time to, to get. So over actually, on Tuesdays, we would practice in the afternoon at Brentwood. And bear in mind, Brentwood is three or four miles away from campus, right? And we'd leave at 530. It would take an hour to get home. <laughs> so I remember my teammates and I would just just go to dinner because it's not even worth it to get back to campus. Yeah. Like you just leave practice and then go go to dinner and not even worry yeah. about. Yeah, that makes sense. It is pretty wild. <laughs> like just LA, it's a different dynamic. You've never been there. Like, I yeah. guess you probably wouldn't quite understand, but <laughs> <laughs> so getting to the golf part of it, you had eight wins. You had two separate four four tournament win streaks, which is oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty saying, oh, there was two. <laughs> there was two. <laughs> pretty remarkable. like not just pretty remarkable. that's amazing. When you think back to when you think back to that time, what are some of the things that do come to mind? I was just having fun, honestly. I think I made it really easy for myself with my mindset towards tournament and golf. Uh, I made each day. There's 18 matches. The first hole is one match. I'm trying to beat the course. So if I try and birdie every single hole, either it turns out as a birdie or not. I'll be okay. I think that's something that really gave me a sense of comfort. I just basically, okay, this first hole, that's the first match. Par, okay, that's done. Next hole, try to birdie again. And I still do that to this day. So I think that concept really helped me. So that's a concept that I came back to because during my two year slump with once I turned professional, I was so, was so nervous about everything. I forgot about that. And then once I dialed it back in and I just remember that and started playing like that again, it all worked out. Yeah. Started working out. Is that a process yeah. that you kind of figured out on your own or started on your own when you're at UCLA? Or is that something that you talked about teammates that kind of were looking out for you and coaches are helping? I don't remember exactly, but I know it was in college. I think it was my sophomore year of college for sure. Yeah, I remember something, someone saying, just beat the course. And I was like, okay, how do you beat the course? And I was like, what if I made every hole its own match? And the goal was to birdie. And if you birdie, maybe four or five out of them, you're in a pretty good spot to win if you think about it. So that's yeah. how I thought of it. I feel like it's, uh, I think that's probably for most people a lot easier said than done. And maybe even your case too. It's like, if you're, say you start that and you, you win your first six matches, it's like six birdies to start the day. Like, is it more difficult or how challenging is it to continue staying in that one hole or one match at a time concept moving forward? So what I realized, if I'm thinking about my score, it tends to get worse. So that's why it's so easy for me to just be like, okay, that hole's over, whatever, just go. Because, I mean, there's one instance, um, I think it was in Utah. My second hole, I tripled. And I think I ended the day one under or even. But I remember, I was like, 
it's just a triple. I'll just birdie the next three holes and we're back to even. Who cares? And that mindset just helped me so much. I think I ended up finishing that tournament. I think I was like 30th after the cut. And then the last day I ended up moving up to eighth place. And I realized, okay, this is what it feels like to just come back from that and just try and birdie every single hole because it's, if there's more holes, there's more birdies. That's what I always think. And so that definitely kickstarted um, the mindset to come back from my college mindset. And then I think the next week I won. So that was my first win. And then I realized, okay, we're back to normal again. And we're back to how we were. And this is the mindset that's actually productive. So let me go and do that. And so I just kept that the whole entire season. And this worked out pretty well. <laughs> I, I would say so. And I, I, I cannot wait to touch on that or to, <laughs> to get it more into that. But just to kind of finish out this UCLA part of your, your life, um, what are some of the, or how did your time at UCLA prepare you for where you are right now? Honestly, I'm so glad that I went to UCLA because we practice at so many different courses that I, I basically felt ready for any tournament we were playing. So we'd have like a great rotation of golf courses and just, I think it's really beneficial when you're not just at one course and just practicing that one course and just doing that stuff. And also <laughs> Alicia, um, she would make a bunch of games for us to play if it was a practice day. And I remember I was like so excited about them. And I think I still do those drills now, basically. And we would have little chipping contests, like whoever finishes, it was like an up and down game. Whoever gets the best score, coach would buy Starbucks the next day for that person. Ooh. So that like those little things, I was like, ooh, I want my Starbucks <laughs> out of mine. And so those little things always helped. And then we'd go on the course and we'd do the same thing. Coach and Alicia would make, uh, she'd, it would be a par four, but they'd put uh, the tee box at 170 and it would be a par three and whoever would get the lowest score. And you do that every hole, it's like a different, they would make par fours, par threes or par threes, par fours somehow and mm. just basically have an up and down game. And then the par would be maybe like 30 instead of 36 because some holes are shorter than the other. Yeah, that I mean, that's really amazing uh, that you still carry that to this day because you are a few years removed uh, from that part of your career. But mm -hmm. can you take us behind the scenes a little bit and share a story that most people wouldn't know? Like an off the course story, like with your teammates. I know that you're still close with a lot of your teammates and several of them are out there doing really well in professional golf as well. Okay, a story. I mean, um, a bus ride or a, a trip or any, <laughs> any little thing. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to think. All I remember is, I think it was my junior year, but we were so, I think our those five girls, our travel team, we got along so well that at restaurants, people would ask us, to lower our voices because we were just laughing and I remember it was a whole year of that and it's just it was just so fun every tournament was fun because we just all bonded really well and I remember coach being like lower your voices or yeah that, and that's the only thing that's a really good thing I remember this was in Vail Colorado we were eating in a fancy restaurant I think and we were just so loud just howling laughing like cackling so <laughs> that's what I remember <laughs> I love that um when you can get to that point I, I can just imagine your coach like hey you're representing UCLA <laughs> just remember that like wherever you're at <laughs> <laughs> so okay you get to the end of your playing at UCLA how did you come to the decision to turn professional and like what was that process like for you I think that was pretty pretty easy after I started winning because after I started winning, I kind of, it, I learned how it felt to win. Right. And so 
I saw, okay, my past teammates have won and they've gone on to turn pro. So I definitely have the skills to go and do that if I wanted to. And so I think my senior year of college, it was the first year where the top five in college golf got exempt into final stage Q series. So of course I'm going to take that opportunity. Right. And so I did. And it kind of made my decision for me, like, okay, you're going to go. Cause now I think it's second stage that it gets in the top five college golfers get into second stage. I think that's what it is now. So so definitely tried and took advantage of that. So you earned partial status, by the way, at that time, um, partial status, LPJ tour status for 2019, which became your rookie year on the LPJ tour. Once you finished Q series, did you realize that it was not like, full status for 2019 um I knew that I had like a pretty good chance of getting into tournaments I know it was definitely it was conditional for sure but I got into Kia so Mm. that was the first event so I figured I could get into a bunch of events after that and get reshuffled in but it didn't turn out so well so (laughs) well I just know that I've talked to some other players that went through even at q school when it was still q school third stage instead of q series they're like they finish at a certain point and it's like oh i made it in but then like i think on the one hand especially when it's your first time going through that process and you're becoming a rookie i think you're just so excited about making it on tour you don't necessarily like know all the ins and outs because there's so much to learn like yeah just so much to learn so I'll get to your professional career. And I want to talk to you because I think that you're a good person to talk to about the mental game. Golf is, is obviously it's a very mental sport, but kind of a combination of your professional career and the mental game go into your tw- uh, rookie year in 2019. What was your mindset heading into that season? I don't think there was a mindset. I just was so, I think, let me preface this by saying LPJ is, the highest level of women's professional golf. And it's such a privilege, but I think I psyched myself out by saying like, this is so different from college golf. Like, um, I think I just made it out to be bigger than what it really was because now that I think of it, a good way, a coping mechanism for me is basically saying, this is just another 18 holes. I've played so many in my life and why am I making this bigger than it needs to be? Cause now I'm like nervous about putting on the putting green with so-and-so and I'm like scared. So let me move out of her way. And I just didn't feel like I belonged. And I thought, Oh, it's going to be like college, which is like, la da da so fun. And everyone's so friendly, but kind of wasn't like that. It's serious, you know, like this is big business. And then I think I felt like I didn't know what to do. I think one of the tournaments I was, uh, an alternate for the pro-am and I didn't know that you needed to check in at your certain time slot and I think I got a message saying that oh I was lucky that no one pulled out of the pro-am because I would have been taken out of the tournament and I think that just like sent me I was like I don't know what I'm doing out here like I don't know where to get help like I don't know how to do anything and then first I didn't feel like I belonged I started playing really badly I just couldn't pick myself up off the ground. And so I went on that downward spiral. People were saying like, oh, she was past world number one, but she's not doing well. I felt like people were holding me to this standard and I wasn't performing to that. And so I was just underperforming. And I think I put a lot of pressure on myself and just all this stuff. And then it just tanked basically. All the confidence I've ever had, just gone, gone in that year like I don't even know I think at that point I didn't even see light at the end of the tunnel I didn't know how to gain it because you gain confidence from playing well but I'm not playing well so where do you get it you can't just have this false confidence yeah right so that's how it went honestly it's like no matter how many of those little games that you play with yourself and practice rounds or how good you can get your your swing feeling when you're at home or like if you're not feeling confident in tournament play, it is going to be like a challenging to get good results. Like Mm -hmm. whoever you are, no matter how good you are. Exactly. 
So, yeah, it was it was a tough year in 2019 to say the least. You moved into 2020, which obviously was like pff, wild, especially like playing on the semester tour, which doesn't usually start until a little bit later into the year. I think there was one event played before the pandemic, yes. like things like shut down. Yeah, so, I th- yeah, that was in March. Um, it was in Florida. Yeah, that was a crazy year for me. 2020 was crazy for me. So like, do you remember, because I just imagine for you or any player that's heading into that year, especially on the Symmetra Tour, where you're like starting in March, this is when everything essentially shut down. Whatever you're mentally prepared for or physically prepared for, and then you just like stop. <laughs> like then all of a sudden you had several months off where you weren't competing and it's just, I don't know, like, what was that experience like for you? So first of all, um, not to get all down and dark, but coming back from that Florida event, we landed and my grandpa, I got, my mom got a call from my aunt that he's at the hospital. They they had to take him to the emergency room. He actually passed away that day when we went there. And I feel that was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So we were able to have a funeral for him. And I was like, not. I feel like I didn't really register it or like fully process processed it, but um, yeah, so that had happened and the pandemic was starting. And actually the last thing my grandpa told me was to go and try my best at my tournament. So that was the last thing he ever said to me. And after he passed, I made it my mission to just try my hardest at every event. And I've done that so far. So I'm really proud of myself. And Honestly, I feel like COVID really helped me. So I'm really not thankful for the virus, but right, I'm right, thankful that course. it gave me this time to basically reflect and work hard on myself. I think that's something that I really, I mean, people ask me all the time, like, what was it that clicked for you? Like, how did you have this tremendous year? And it was like basically everything falling into place. So on the range. I remember after my, my golf club had opened back up after the pandemic and after the pandemic, I mean, during, like, as it got better and my course opened back up, I was on the range and this man had asked me, Oh, why aren't you playing at the ANA right now? You're pretty good. What's, what's wrong. (laughs) And I had said like, Oh, I'm going through a really hard year. Um, not playing well. And he was like, well, I think I have two book recommendations that you, that would really help you. And um, you're, you look like a good player. So I think this would really help you. And then um, we were leaving for my tournament on the next Sunday. So I told him, I was like, Hey, I don't think Barnes and Noble is open right now. So I don't think I'll be able to get it. And then I'm leaving for my tournament. So I won't come here in time. And then he was like, you know what? I'll just give you my copy. So he gave me both of the books and I was able to take that to my tournament and I read it during the tournament and things just started to click better. But it was The Slight Edge, which is a self-help personal development book and then Extraordinary Golf, which is, there's some technique in there, but it was more about the mental golf thing. And um, so I took that and I got progressively better because in extraordinary golf this really helped me when I was not playing well and even so at the end of 2020 I was not playing well I did not feel like myself or I didn't know where my hands were I didn't know where the ball was going to go I was still in that mindset so that's like two two years the end of my two year slump was towards the end of 2020 yeah and um so I didn't really feel good with my golf game but in the extraordinary golf book he said something, it was by Fred Shoemaker, by the way, if anyone wants to know, and um, basically said the next shot could be the best shot you ever hit. And that just transcended my golf game. It put me in an optimistic, positive, excited mindset before hitting the next shot. And that's something that really helped me. And then being positive helped my entire game. Just absolutely. And then the Slide Edge was more of a personal development book in which you're going to you're going to try to be the best person that you can be 
And every day you're going to do something to make yourself 1% better. Little things, little self-development stuff. And this guy that gave me uh, the books ended up, he's now my mentor. And we, our goal was for me to become the best person I can be. So we focus on that. Obviously the goal is to play well and then end up being whatever my goals are. <laughs> and so we focus on being the best person I can be and personal development. And then my golf game became better after that. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> I worked on myself and then my golf followed. Wow. I guess is the best thing to say. So you're now a mentor. Did you know him before? Before no, this? No, not like, at all. So this was like at the range. He just yeah. like one of like an example that actually turned out good because yeah. I know <laughs> I know so many times, especially for women, which is so frustrating. But unsolicited advice, like the oh, <laughs> like hey, yeah. I think you should be <laughs> yes, I think you should be doing this. Oh yeah, <laughs> really? Well, why don't you go yeah. shoot like you're out there shooting in the nineties and over in the hundreds? Like I think I'm okay, but I this think... one turned out really well. So it's at my club so people are pretty they do well there people yeah, yeah at yeah. my home club so and I saw him hit he's pretty good and he's maybe 63 and I saw him hitting he's pretty good he's maybe he's a three handicap and he basically said that he thinks that his peak golf isn't here yet like it's still yet to come and I was like dang if he has this mindset and I'm only I think I was 23 or 22 at the time but 22 and I was like dang, if he thinks about himself this way, I got to start thinking about myself this way. And then he had told me about the slide edge book. And he said, if I had had this book when I was 20, 24, I'd be so much more successful than I am now. And I, he's, I think he said, like, I had a bunch of mentors help me out. So I would love to give back and help young people out the, the, any way I can. And so I was like, oh, this, this sounds really good. And at this point, I was in a mindset as anything could help honestly yeah yeah. I was literally hitting golf balls on the range for three to four hours and I had hurt my shoulder just hitting so many golf balls and so not only did I suck I hurt myself doing Jeez. it because I thought I was getting better and so I think everything just fell into place after that we started working together and then I just fell in love with books after that and then I just never started reading and like every single day I just try to be one percent better than the previous day I love that so much so <laughs> like as as you said so 2020 you're just looking at the the starts that you made you think you made seven starts and you missed four of those cuts so you weren't necessarily like getting the results yet but when like before the 2021 season started is that when you already kind of in this process of you'd already read the books, you'd already like kind of entered this mindset? Yeah. And so after the 2020 season, I think there was only eight. Uh, so 2020 was the symmetric, my first full symmetric season. Right. And so it didn't really click immediately after reading those books. But then there's there's more downtime the off season before the next symmetric season. And so I just really worked on myself and read those books, read more books, started playing golf and playing golf with my mentor and then just always having a game playing against people. And I just stopped with the range ses sessions. Like I'd go warm up. Yeah, obviously. And then, yeah, yeah. but I'd go on the course and just do all of my stuff there because that's where you score. And there's always this, I mean, um people always ask how do you transition range practice to golf like how do you bring what you practice on the range to the course I honestly think you go to the course and you practice it because at the range you always have an extra ball you always could just rake in just hit the same shot and you're like oh it works we'll go on the course and try it and then that's how you really learn to get better in my opinion yeah and you also like on the range and especially for most, like the ranges that most people have access to, it's like you have fairway turf that you're hitting off of. You're not getting a lot of practice out of the rough. And how many mm -hmm. people are at the professional level too, like you don't, no one hits 100% of their fairways. So you're like, and you're not, even if you do, you're not going to get a flat lie 
every single time. Like there's what you're saying on the golf course, there's way more like the situations you're actually going to face in competitive rounds. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So as you enter the 2021 season, as successful as it was, the very start of it was not necessarily like the greatest. You finished tie 58 in your first start, missed the cut in your second start. Then things started to turn around. But after those first two starts, was there any like the self-doubt starting to creep back in? Or were you still like, no, I'm, I'm feeling good and I'm the results are going to come? Oh, the beginning of 2021? Yes, the beginning of 2021. Okay, there's like a separate story to that. Um, okay, okay. So I'm pretty sure leading up to, I think my game got really good during the off season leading up to the 2021 season. So I was already feeling good. And I had a, not a nightmare caddy story at my first event, <laughs> but basically it just wasn't good. And I wanted to fire him after the first day because I just couldn't with him. And I think I made the cut. There was definitely a tipping point. It was the second day. He fell into the bunker during one of my playing competitors putting and she had to ask him to move. And I think a volunteer had asked my mom, is that your daughter's caddy? <laughs> what is he doing? Oh no. And um, so I uh gave him the boot after I made the cut and then I had to push my own cart on the last day it just didn't turn out well I think that's I was I felt like my game was in a good place it was just all this extra noise that right. kept me from playing well on the last day so I wasn't too butthurt about that and then I had to scramble to find a new caddy for the next week and I think at Beaumont we didn't play well it's just because I was just trying to get acclimated and used to him and then honestly that's when Don and I started working together and then just took off after that never looked back everything happens for a reason everything happens for a reason if I'm being yes honest. <laughs> no I I believe yeah. that too because if you just look so I do have these written down finished after that start so your third start of 2021 you finished tie fourth then you finished tie eighth and then your first career victory, victory at the Garden City Charity Classic at Buffalo Dunes. So I guess we, you kind of talked about it. I was going to ask if there's anything you can credit for that, for that turnaround. But is there, I guess I will ask, is there anything specific? I guess everything leading up to it or everything just for, lined up? For the win, the first one? For the win, for the first win, yeah. Ooh, this one is... Uh... Okay, let me see. So I think I gained a lot of confidence. So I was playing well at home, but seeing that I was doing pretty okay at the beginning of the season, um, I think that really helped me and get me ex got me excited for the next couple of tournaments and the, for the rest of the season, on, uh, honestly. And then I think Sawela was the Air Tucson event was a really good one for me because that was when I was truly in contention and I had good memories there. So I was just excited to be at Sawelo and just play that course again. And I played pretty well. And then I took that confidence that I gained from it to the, to all the events afterwards. And it just started building all these confidence levels. And um, I think just knowing that I had a pretty decent game and I could play in the wind at Tucson really helped me. And then we played in Utah, which was astronomical. The wind was ridiculous. The ball's shaking on the putting green. Yeah, yeah. It was just crazy. And I remember, I think this is when I really changed my final day mindset. So it was the final day and I knew it was going to be the windiest day of everything. So I figured, okay, if I shoot under par, I'm going to shoot up really quick because I play, I'm pretty confident with playing in the win. Like I know I can score. And so I was like, okay, it's final day. There's nothing to lose. You already made the cut. So you, you either go low or you don't. So I was like, I'm going to go low. <laughs> and so I tried to make as many birdies as I could. And I think I shot 
four or five under for the day and it shot me up like all the way to eight and I was like oh this is fun now I can try it like now I, I think that day I was like I'm gonna try and birdie every hole like truly that's when I fully grasped onto that old concept of trying to birdie every single hole and I did that and I was like oh I did a pretty good job today let's let's try it next week and went to Garden City and did the same thing I think I changed my mindset there I think my goal for that week was to be right before each shot I would say like I love this shot and I did it every single shot and it turned out really well even Garden City was super windy I think the the stretch of those three events are just completely windy so I was already I knew that I could play in the wind and so I was just excited to play again I was like okay it's yeah. another eight balls that I get to try and birdie every single hole and I truly believe that I could so just try it every single hole and every round and it turned out pretty well <laughs> I would yeah it, turned out, <laughs> it did turn out pretty well <laughs> so so after that win, I think you played 13 more events after that, and you finished outside the top 20 only two times, and that included two more wins and four other top fours. So like, thinking back to all these Yeah, these I'm moments, trying to think. I was like, uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> like you, so you truly did carry it throughout the rest of the season. And those two other, I think you did miss one cut too. But the, like in golf, nobody, no matter how good you're playing, like there is still going to be like, there's going to be a round or two where you're just, yeah, whatever, for whatever reason, your back could be a little tight or whatever. Um, so as you approach, the, like, I guess question is after this learning experience that you've gone through going from probably for you, some of the lowest, especially in your golf life, lowest parts, lowest places you could be reaching getting back up to some of the highest places that you could be what's some advice that you give to golfers really at any level that are going through a tough time with their golf game I think the when you're going through the hardest time is to just basically be very grateful where you're at because people would really kill to be in your position and don't take things for granted um, something that helped me when I was in a bad place was just make tiny goals that are achievable and just keep making those goals along the way because you'll be like, oh, I achieved my goal. And then you go to the next one and you keep doing it. And that gets you excited for the bigger goals in the long run. And just, I think, so this past year, I was able to do a player panel and Nancy Lopez was there. And she said something that at the end of her round, if she's able to look back at the course and say that she gave it her all, that's all you can ask for. And after that, I was like, I'm taking this and I'm running with it. <laughs> and so I'm glad to say that I actually ended up doing that every single round, just knowing that I never gave up and I gave it my all. And that's all you can do for that day because it's very doable and that's all you can ask for. So all that stuff. I love it. <laughs> so, so shifting to this year, back on the LPGA tour, where, you, where I'm sure that you've been looking forward to since, well, since, I don't know, I guess since you left in 2019. <laughs> um, yeah. What are you looking forward to the most this season? Just playing new golf courses, meeting more people, seeing more people come out to events. I, I love when the little kids come out to events because that's so cute to me. And then just love seeing them and hopefully inspiring them um to play golf too and compete and all that stuff and yeah I'm excited to travel I love traveling I and I just love tournaments in general so <laughs> I, I'm just super excited for this whole year I think it's, it's gonna be a good one for sure I think so too um if you don't mind sharing you don't have to share all of them but what are some of your goals for this year hmm. um just to be nicer to myself I think um because I'm trying not to put a lot of pressure on performing right out the gate I know I'm gonna have to like this past year I was kind of a rocky start but I got the hang of it after the third or fourth event and I know it's gonna be the same for this so definitely be nice to myself first first tournament going in because it's just 
uh, basically a different environment. I don't have all my friends from Symmetra going with me to um, LPGA, but it's definitely going to be different. And I'm going to see people that I knew from college and all that stuff. So that'll be fun to see them again. And then, yeah, traveling to really cool places. So I'm excited for that. Yeah. Um, so how would you describe yourself as a golfer? Quiet, competitive. Quiet, competitive. Um, I feel like I, I get into this mindset when I'm playing a tournament where I'm like really focused about the next shot. Like that's all I care about. And it sounds so repetitive, but I truly think that I'm really good at one shot at a time because nothing else is important. It's just the shot in front of you. How do I get this shot next to the hole or in the hole? And that's, and just going through that process is just so fun to me. It's like that putting thing where, how do I get this in the hole? Where's the break? What speed do I need? What line am I going to take? And I think luckily I just really love the process of golf and leading up to that shot. So yeah. <laughs> are you a, are you a talker on the golf course? Like with your playing like your group or yeah. Yeah. So um, I tend to be pretty introverted, but I think in my group, um, I love talking to my caddy Don and we don't talk about golf in between shots. No, that's just, no, <laughs> that's enough. And then I always like asking my playing competitors like, Oh, you have any plans this week? Or like, where have you eaten or where are you staying? Just small stuff like that, because I really enjoy and realize if I just, stay really serious and I don't talk to anybody and I'm unfriendly it's it doesn't turn out well so <laughs> it's, it's that's not the path I'm trying to go down so like essentially you become kind of unfocused in between the shots to be most focused when you're yes at, at your shots actually hitting the shots. yeah basically preserving my focus level because if you do five five hours of yeah. just complete focus on that shot you get really worn out and tired and exhausted and I'm not going to do that to myself I'm just gonna save it for that little 30 second period and just focus on that and just try to do my best doing those little time slots yeah that makes a lot of sense I think that a, a lot of people <laughs> amateur and professionals could could learn from that for sure <laughs> like it's it's easy to get caught up on wanting to like you're always thinking about the next shot. Take some time. Like the yeah. mental exhaustion is real. Like in that, yeah. what are some of the strengths of your game? Hmm. Uh, definitely my mental game. I mean, we talked about this, but the jokes always, oh, golf's 80% mental, 20% brain, which is all mental basically. And I feel like I've really improved on that. So that's one of my strengths now. I think I look at golf through a different lens now, more optimistic. I think every problem has a solution. Okay, I just pulled my drive into the rough. Well, I've made birdies from the rough before. It's fine. Move on. I'm not a bad ball striker, so pretty sure I can just either get this on the green and then have a chance of birdie or pretty good short game. I can get up and down easy. Little stuff like that. Just being super positive and making golf fun. I know it sounds so dumb and I'm always like, oh, I'm just trying to have fun. But that's honestly what I'm trying to do. Making golf fun. There's how I make golf fun is are those little matches that I have between myself and the golf course. And so doing that is fun to me. And so yeah. everyone can find their own way of fun. And that's my definition of fun. I like it. I would <laughs> also say that you're a very good putter. I know I mentioned that a while ago, but even like in 2020, which was a like down, down year for you on Symmetra, you finished the year ninth in putts, in green, putts per green regulation, 1.79 and second in putts per round, 28.82. And last year, <laughs> there's a reason, there's a reason though. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the reason I remember my caddy Don told me this. And so I was playing um, with, hold on, I'm trying to remember her name. I only know her Thai nickname, but okay. Um, so I was playing, he was caddying for a Thai girl and we were playing together. 
and I was playing horrible. And I, would re I was like, why is he giving me his business card after the round? Because I'm just pretty sure I shot like 83 or something. And I was going through like mental breakdown at this point and give me his card. And after that fall through with the first caddy at the beginning of last year's season, um, I texted him like, hey, are you available for the Beaumont event? Um, I really need a caddy. And he was like 100% available. I was looking for a bag and I was like, perfect, it's go time. And I think I asked him, why did you give me your card? And he, he said, you made the best up and downs for bogey. So trust me, the, the putts thing is because I was making up and downs for bogey that, <laughs> that year. Trust me, I did not hit any greens. It was just me making up and downs for bogey trust me so that's why that year turned out the way it did on stats uh, on the putting stats yeah. i know i know putting can be like somewhat misleading because you have to look at the other stats like you need the other <laughs> stats like is the scoring average greens is, and right is, is, is yeah. the greens regulation good yeah. like then they line up it's like oh if you miss like more than half your are like 15 greens in regulation but you get up and down like most of the yeah. time then your putts are going to be I good think <laughs> yeah, I think there was once that I was looking at and it was, I think I had like 11 putts for nine holes. I was like, that's all just up and down because <laughs> I'm not hitting the it's green. Like, no, no birdies, no getting, yeah. no going low from those yeah. putts. Well, okay. Well, la but last year though, where you did have a lot of success and I think you were first in scoring average as well. So this like, it lines up. You were fourth with 1.76 putts for green regulation and sixth with 29.56 putts per round so like the putting the putting was still there with yeah better results uh in the big picture too I think that was proximity though like hitting closer yeah I honestly think so because so what my mentor and I did during the off season is he would every hole we try to hole out or make a hole in one and we started playing like that every well he did that already by himself and I, <laughs> yeah. I he gave me like certain incentive and rewards to if I made a hole in one or if I hold out there would be certain rewards and so we just played like that every single day and that I brought that type of mentality on into my tournament play and if you think about it when you try to hold out from the fairway you're going to be in a pretty good spot if you don't end up holding it out. You're probably going to be maybe at most 20. Okay, maybe you're going to miss the green. But usually it's probably within 20 feet and you'll be okay because in my head, I'm like, oh, I'm a good putter. I can probably make that. So yeah, that, that gave me certain confidence. But definitely hitting it closer helped because now I'm thinking, what's, what's the distance? And how much club do I need to get there if I want to hole out? And then how to hit it there. Do I land on the right side of the green? It's going to kick left. Certain things like that. It's not just hitting at the hole. There's a whole bunch of th other things involved. Right. And I thought that was so fun. <laughs> <laughs> I love that like everything comes back to, even from the earliest memory, like these little games inside the big game of yeah. golf. Like all the time. And I know like based on your college story, it doesn't even take a lot of incentive. Even just Starbucks. Is enough oh, yeah. uh, enough to get I you on your game. <laughs> every like positive reinforcement really works on me. If it's like a negative one, like okay, if you three putt, you're gonna have to run around the track. I think I just uh tank real quick. Yeah. Positive reinforcement works really quick for me. Do you have any like for yourself? Like if I shoot under par, I get to have ice cream, or if I do this, I get like do you have um, any? No, I think. I think the ice cream wouldn't be good because then I'd just like try and get ice cream every single day. I think yeah. it's more of no, I don't really do that. No, but I do try and like if I had a good golf day, I try like once a week to go try a new coffee shop. I don't know. That's just like my simple pl pleasures. I love doing that stuff. That's good. And yeah. shout out to the small businesses too. Yes, absolutely. I like that. Um, one more part on like the the golf aspect and just a couple quick questions about like outside of golf. But okay. <laughs> the evolution of your practice routine. 
it's like I just want to hear from your perspective because things have to change when you're a junior obviously like there's other interests and other things going on you want to be with play with your friends or whatever college golf you also have classes and professional golf like that's your job so like Mm -hmm. what is that evolution of like practice or your routine because routines are important too so I think in college those little games help because we didn't have as much time as I do now to practice so we'd either be doing qualifying or we'd be practice or there would be a free day where you're free to do whatever you want but I hated the free days because I wanted coach to tell me what to do because that's just so I have like sense of direction and I feel like transitioning into professional golf and now that I graduated I'm free to do whatever I want and I just felt really lost so I'm like okay I guess I'll just stay at the range for five hours since nowhere to go this is this is it and that was not not productive at all And so once I start reflecting and taking what little things work for me in college and basically doing the same things again to to help me and guide me. So I would still do little games, but by myself, like I would give, okay, there's gonna be nine up and down chips with that I would have to finish out. All of them are part, part two. And out of, I would have to make seven out of nine up and down. So three from the uh, from the fringe, three from the rough and three from the bunkers. And so if I could make seven out of nine up and downs, I'm in a pretty good spot. So that's something that I do. And then I do some putting drills that I do and then do my range stuff with my track man. And then, yeah, go from there. So just basically taking little things that have worked for me and then transitioning it over to professional golf practice because I feel like I didn't have a sense of direction after I turned pro because I was just free to do whatever. So right. there's that. Yeah. It's like, oh, I don't have any exams to study for. Yeah. And it's like, well, what do I do? So like at, at this point, do you have a, a routine when you show up to a tournament week? It's pretty like you feel comfortable with or? A routine. Um, I do. I always do the same putting drill. And then because it's pretty quick. It doesn't take too long. And then there's two drills that I do. And then just practice rounds. Um, Practice rounds where you get all the answers. That's where you get all the answers, like off the tee and stuff and what you want having going into the greens. And then I don't really focus on huge practice sessions during like right after my practice round or after my round. Like after my round, my tournament round, if I didn't feel good in a certain area, I'd go on the range for 10, 20 minutes and then leave because I know in the long run, I'd probably need more energy the next day than actually figuring something out. And yeah. obviously when you're warming up for the round, your tournament round, you're not there to figure stuff out. So it's, I remember Annika Sorenstam saying this, like it's a warm right. up. So you're just warming up. You're not just figuring something out. And I remember my best round last year. I had the worst warm up session. I literally, I was that week, I was hitting my driver poorly. Usually it was kind of an outlier week for me. I think on hole number 15, there was an overhanging tree on the right on that par five. The tree's not even in your way. I like <laughs> sliced it and hit that tree. It went. 40 yards off the tee on a par five. I'm like, great. The one reachable par five, the one reachable par five. I just have to hit that tree. And then, um, I somehow managed shot under par that day with my driver going everywhere. And I was like, great. Okay. But I did play well enough to make the cut. So I was like, okay, the next day was final day. My driver is just doing its thing again. And <laughs> I remember it was, I had like an early tea time because obviously when you're lower on the list, you tee off earlier in the day. So I was like rushing. I'm like, okay, it's cold. Let me just hit. And I'm like, well, this is going to be interesting. (laughs) And so I think right before I teed off, I was like, okay, let's see what we can do with my driver doing this. Like, let's just see what can happen. Like it can't, it can't be worse than yesterday. So I was like, let's just see how well we can play. And I was managing it pretty well and my approach shots were really good so 
I think I was five under after nine and on hole number 10, banana slice into the tree line. And I remember I was like, well, I mean, if I can lay up into the fairway, maybe I can make birdie on this hole too. And I laid up to about 110 and that was my sweet spot number for that day. I was just like on fire. If I was in that range, I hit it to three feet, birdied it. Jeez. Next hole, it was a short par four and I had maybe 90 yards. I hit it to a foot and one of my playing competitors turns to me and she's laughing because it was so ridiculous. That day was ridiculous. I was literally hitting it to this and I was like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just tried my best. And so even with, I think I sliced three drives that day, but I ended up shooting nine under and I went from 25th to second place on the last day. And I was like, dang, if I can shoot under par with my driver going the opposite direction than I was expecting I think I'm pretty good for the rest of the season like let's just try this mindset every single time so I'm like okay I never get stressed out about a bad warm-up because it doesn't define who you are I've hit a million shots I'm not gonna kill myself over one slice it's fine yeah so if you that's can, something you know that you've hit also like a lot of those are super good too. Yeah. So I know that it's just one bad shot. And like the extraordinary golf set, the next shot could be your best. So I just look forward to that. Yeah. It, it especially helps when you have the ability and skill set to do it because <laughs> not to just a quick reference to me. When I was started playing golf a lot at age 16, I had only Tiger in my head all yeah. these are amazing recovery shots. So I would go out, of course, I'm just not that good, but I hit like, hit a big slice and be in the trees and like, okay, I'm going to hit a big slice on purpose to get around the trees and like all this or a big hook. Like, no, I don't have the, like I had no business attempting it because I don't have <laughs> the bill. I don't even know how to hit a fade or a draw. on. Like, I don't know how to do that. Why am I thinking that I can, but whenever you get to like your level, you have, you have the mindset, but you also have the ability to do it. So you line that up and then you get, yeah, you that, get the good results. That's true. So I probably shouldn't expect the amateur to do that. But... No, no, no. I think the advice is still good. It just is like <laughs> <laughs> for the amateurs, but for the yeah. professionals, especially like, of course. And that shows the, the, the mark of a really good player too. Um, as like tiger reference, I just remember all the times, like, he would talk about playing his C game that day and he'd be shooting like 69 or 70. Yeah. And it's like, and yeah, I have definitely felt that at one event that I actually won, I didn't feel like I had my A game. So I ended up winning that tournament and I took that and I was like, okay, even with your C game, you're able to shoot pretty well. So let's see what we can do next week when you actually have your A or B game. And so that's, I always try and take the positives of everything because you can see different things, negative or positive. And I, I'm just going to take it in positive. I think I could also transition it during mid round too. So I remember in New York, Twin Bridges Championship, it was eighth hole. I was in the final group and it's, that was a really tough thing for me. This because I remember that was was that my second win? Maybe. I think it was my second win. It was really tough for me because my first win, I was in the final round, but I was playing with one of my best friends, Beth. So it was very like, oh, we're just playing another round together like we always do. So it was very normal for me. So I wasn't used to the final round pressure where these two other players are in contention with you. Like we're all in contention. It's very hard to be in the final group and not pay attention to how they're doing because you want to win the event, right? And so I remember they were doing pretty well. And on the eighth hole, I hit my pitching wedge to 20 feet and it spun all the way to the front of the green because there was a tear. And I literally was being such a brat. And I was like, Jesus, like can't even hit a pitching wedge close to the 
Peyton, what are you going to do? You're not going to convert. And so I like putted and then I, it was up the tier. And I think I had like four feet to make for par downhill slide or whatever. I made it. And then I think I slammed my putter and I was like, this is so stupid. I can't even play today. And I was walking to the next hole and I was like, you know what? I'm playing bad because I'm in a bad mood. Let me just switch this up really quick and let's just have some fun and let's see if we can birdie all the holes on the back nine. Hole number nine is part three. I hit it to 15 feet and I made it for birdie. Literally like switched my mindset really quick. And then um, I kept playing and then uh, I just focused on myself, like just trying to birdie. And I remember I bogeyed this, it was like 13th hole. And I was like, okay, this kind of doesn't put me in a good position now that I bogeyed. And so the next hole comes, it's a par five. They moved up the tee box and I'm like, oh, it's go time. Reachable par fives, I love that. And then, so I hit and I ended up in a good spot. And I think it was 160 downwind, but it was uphill, like definitely like 20, 20 yards uphill. Okay. And so we ended up with six iron and I hit this shot and it was, I don't even remember what I was thinking about during this shot. I just remember I was like, six iron feels pretty good in my hands. And then I hit and it was dead on with a flag and there, there was a crowd up at the green and they're just like screeching. So I thought I had made it. So I thought it was okay. It was pretty good. I know it's on the green, but I don't know how good I don't. I hate it when I'm like, oh, it's probably like a foot. It's like 10 feet. So, oh, yeah, yeah. so I'm like, oh, then yeah, I hit it and it was a foot away and I tapped it in for Eagle and that was my transition. And then I just finished out pretty okay. So was able to clinch the win. I I love that you were able to like that 180. Like it's legitimately a yeah. 180. And I don't know how many people can do that. But I yeah. mean you're so at this point you've already won, you've had some success in, in your season before that. So, mm -hmm. so it, I mean, I guess it makes sense that you could re like flash back to some, like, you know, that your game's in a good place. It's just about executing at that point. Yeah. If I'm in a good headspace, it usually turns out pretty well. So I think that's a really important thing for me. And I remember that tournament was really important to me because that was probably the at that point that was the hardest golf course we played because it forces you to actually hit driver off the tee and mm -hmm. I knew I, I could win at uh previously because we didn't always take driver off the tee I laid up a lot and I do that because I want to give myself a full shot to stop it on the green if it's super windy and that stuff but yeah. I wanted to see if my game could and being able to win at that level because I know the LPGA's on the longer end and it's going to be like that so that week was definitely a confidence boost because I knew I could do it after it finished I finished that way and so that was that's a win that I look back to a lot because I was able to win with a driver in my hand all the time constantly and it being on the longer end being narrow being traditional golf course so, right so mm -hmm. like and now that's something about golf too obviously like the competitors that you the field that you're in that matters somewhat, but the golf courses too, is like, okay, if I can play well on a legitimately very challenging, more LPGA level course, then that shows you like really, really gives you a good idea of where you're at. Yeah. And pre people probably think that I, it was so easy to win. Right. But it's not because on the first day, I was three over through nine. And I think I was, it was just a matter of me not getting the speed down. It was a little quick. And on the back nine, somehow finished one under par for the whole day. And so I was like, okay, that's good. I can turn things around like that. And I think that's when it really clicked for me because I finished that way. And the next day I was like, I'm really excited to play because now I got the speed down and it's just going to be a fun day. And we can see what we can come up with. And then that happened. And then third round, the final round happened. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's so amazing. By the way, your recollection of golf tournaments, 
pulls, swings, like sh- individual shots. It's pretty remarkable. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, it's kind of like that Vision 54 thing. You want to have a really good memory box. Yeah. So I try to remember all the good things and all the bad things. I'm like, oh, well, I came back from that anyways. I yes. tripled that, but I ended up even par or I ended up <laughs> under par. So that means I really fought my way back and that I could do it. And like I said, I always just think like more holes, more birdies. Yes. Okay. So to get to this very last portion of this podcast, which by the way, thank you so much for taking, oh, yeah, taking some time. <laughs> I want to touch on a couple things outside of golf and I could not let you leave without talking to you a little bit about TikTok. <laughs> because, <laughs> because I, I, uh, well, I ha- I do follow you on TikTok, but I've seen you, like, you enjoy to do some things outside of golf. And so, first <laughs> of all, I have a question. Do you have any favorite TikTokers? Hmm. Oh, my gosh. I usually, I'm trying to think. I mean, I follow a bunch of people, but I feel like I use that. I think I follow a lot of, like, positivity coaches and life coaches. That's what I use it for. And I know I like get into like a deep dark hole and I'm just scrolling for hours at night. But if I like just change it from the for you page to the following page, it I really absorb all of that stuff and I just keep going and that I feel like that's really good. And that's what I honestly use TikTok for and like the funny videos for sure. Because those make me laugh. And I'm trying to think about. No, I, I don't have a favorite TikToker. That's okay. The only thing that came to mind is like, I do have a favorite podcast. So I don't know why I thought about that. What is your favorite podcast? Um, so one of the best podcasts I just listened to. So do you know, so Lewis Howes has a School mm-hmm. of Greatness podcast. And he had a podcast with Sean White. Okay. And everything that Sean White said in that podcast I found a little bit about myself like oh I do that too and so it was he basically showed how his failures and his just unappreciation of snowboarding after he didn't do well at the Olympics I think he was really down on himself and then he said that he was sitting outside at his Malibu house and he was just like pitying himself and then he saw like a dolphin or a whale outside of the water. And he's like, wow, I live here and I have all this and I'm being so ungrateful. And then he basically transitioned that mindset into snowboarding. And I think he went on to win another gold medal. And just like little stuff like that, I was like, oh, see, he always saw light at the end of the tunnel. He was able to basically switch gears with that. And I love that podcast I'm trying to tell everybody about it I was like Sean White Lewis House best podcast I've ever listened to and I listened to all the Lewis House stuff he has at least a thousand episodes with amazing people so different people yeah Yeah. I definitely learned a lot from that one but I I even bought the two books that (laughs) Sean White was talking about and I'm about to read it the first one tonight nice I I like that Sean White example that does like resonate with you because it seems like you could almost, if you had a specific moment, you had, you mentioned a triple bogey that you had, I think, or like one of the first tournaments last year. Mm-hmm. And then you just like, after that, you're like, you know what? It's okay. I want to bounce yeah. back from this. And it's like, maybe that wasn't the defining moment, but it's sometimes mm-hmm. just like a little thing that can make a massive difference. Yeah. I feel like now thinking back, it's always the hard stuff that helped me grow and see light at the end of the tunnel and basically accelerate me growing and playing better as a person and as a golfer. So it's always, like I said, everything happens for a reason, even the bad and the good. So there's always a lesson that comes out of it. Yeah, for sure. What's a perfect non-golf week for you? Well, it wouldn't be perfect if golf's not in it. (laughs) I think I was telling someone at the golf course I think the saddest part of my day is leaving the golf course (laughs) because typically there's traffic and I can't play golf because there's no sunlight so I was like yeah I'm just sitting in traffic for 20 minutes sad (laughs) 
you know what like that is so awesome to hear not that like it's no shade at any other players but there's some people that will be like obviously they they love golf at some point or they do a little bit but it gets tough to truly love the game when it becomes your job and i love that that you like (laughs) you have i love that you have this much love (laughs) for golf (laughs) Actually, there's like another thing that happened yesterday. I was playing with my friend and I was going for this par five in two and I hit it. It was really good, but I just pulled it maybe like five yards and it went into the bunker on the left. And after I hit into the bunker, I was like, I've never been in that bunker. I'm excited to try it. And he literally turns to me and he goes, that's such a golfer's mentality. And I was like, I'm so excited. And I ended up birdieing it. So I was like, it's not a bad bunker, honestly. (laughs) He said, let's go. (laughs) <laughs> I'm excited for this challenge. <laughs> yeah. And once I said it, I was like, oh my gosh, I sound so fake, but it's not. I'm genuinely excited to see how that bunker is compared to the other side, which I usually miss on the other side. And I was like, this one's so much better. That's awesome. <laughs> um, okay. A few rapid fire questions to finish oh, up. Okay. First, yes, first I love one. This. <laughs> well, I hope you like the questions. Early golf or Twilight golf? Ooh both um i usually like twilight golf because uh the sunset such a you answer i'm just like yeah all golf all golf is great <laughs> so I'm, I'm playing both okay sunsets okay um if you could have any superpower what would it what would it be Ooh, ooh, ooh. um to fly fly over traffic so i could just get to the golf course sooner a very la answer too <laughs> <laughs> coffee or tea coffee I have coffee right here. Ooh, okay. <laughs> um, breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Breakfast. Every breakfast, time. Every time? Yeah. Would you eat breakfast for lunch and dinner too? I could. I really wanted to eat avocado toast for dinner yesterday. So I had it this morning. Nice. <laughs> Instead. <laughs> and last question. Two hole-in-ones in one round or course record? Course record every time. Easy. <laughs> yeah, I want a course record at every course. Do you have any course records? Uh, I do at my home club. I have two from different tea boxes. So, <laughs> gross. Oh, um, no. I said, I don't know if you saw me congratulate you, but I, that's amazing, Thanks. incredible. Um, super jealous. Two course records, so two different tea boxes. And I think I have the course, well, at that time, course record at Silverado, Napa. I shot nine under, but uh, yeah, no. I keep shooting 63. I really want to shoot 62. You know what? Maybe 60. I don't know oh. if that's a little too ambitious, but it's oh, 59. I had, I think I had, I had an interview with, cause we were doing some sponsorship stuff with uh, JT Poston and Pat and Kazire. And they were saying their cor- like course, or the lowest round they've ever shot. And they were like 60, 61. And I'm like 63. <laughs> yeah oh so so <laughs> sad nine I mean, under I was, like, I was like yeah I shot it three times can't really break through right now I'm trying you okay look 2022 I believe a 62 or better is in your future that's that's what I'm, so. I'm that's what I'm predicting what I, what I, I think I'm I think I'm long overdue I think you're right yeah I'll get back <laughs> to you at the end of this year I, I can't wait for it. Um, <laughs> Lilia, thank you so, so much for taking, it ended up being longer than I thought, but <laughs> I do appreciate your time so much. It's been a lot of fun and I wish you the best of luck this season. And I, I will see you at a tournament some, sometime coming up. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And thank you for listening to me ramble about golf. <laughs> no, I, that's why we're here. I, <laughs> especially if I can't, if I don't have to talk that much hearing golf stories is the best. So I know so I felt much. like I, I went on a bunch of different tangents, but ho- hopefully good content. No, it's amazing. And I, uh, <laughs> it's, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you, Ben.